So two weeks ago, again, this is a part of a, a six-part series um, that we're, we're trying to build upon each week. And two weeks ago, Jossie Ross, a former Evergreen alum and a current um, Native American activist and, and, and lawyer, spoke very powerfully about racism and equity and, and, and history and case law and environment and allyship and really wrapped it around the story of Billy Frank Sr. And he concluded his talk with challenging us to have, or Junior, um, for us to have, sorry, Junior, um, thank you, Gene, um, to have, to begin having audacious conversations. And the two questions that he left us with is, if equity is not about, it's not about the willingness to give something up, then what is it about? Okay. And the second question is, if the purpose of equity is to find alternative voices, a different consciousness, where are we going to look for other bodies of knowledge and ways of knowing? So we seminared on these, on these questions the Thursday following Jossie's talk. And we're going to continue to have these discussions each Thursday um, following each of these speakers that come on Monday. And they are held in SEM 2A, 1107, from noon to 1. And we're going to continue to work towards Jossie's challenge for us to have continuing, ongoing, audacious conversations because that's what's required for us to find the solutions. So last Monday, our nation recognized the life and legacy of MLK. First Peoples partnered with SPSAC Diversity Office and hosted the second annual Legacy Conference. So thank you, First Peoples, for doing that. But what was missing was us taking time on our campus to reflect on MLK and his legacy and everything that is a part of what we should think about on those days. So I would like to ask people to take a moment of silence to think about MLK and the countless black and brown lives that historically have been, that have been lost due to racism. And not just for MLK, but the possibly millions of folks over the last 500 years. So people can just take 30 seconds and reflect. Greatly appreciate it. Thank you. So we all remember MLK's I Have a Dream speech in 1963. Or else we, we don't remember the whole thing, we just remember parts of it, you know. The part that we can all recite about little black boys and little black girls and, you know, holding hand on the top of a mountaintop, right? But what we don't know, or most of us are unfamiliar with, is one of the speeches that he made later in life and it's titled The Other America, made in Stanford, delivered in Stanford in 1967. And really, that, that, his message that day was really looking back on what had been accomplished in the Civil Rights Movement and what was yet to come. So, you know, I, I typically talk negatively about people who read MLK stuff in front of folks, but I'm going to do it anyways, <laughs> right? And I'm going to just take a, a, a piece of, of this speech that I felt really resonated with me and would hope it would resonate with you for the discussions that we're going to have. And I would encourage you to, to one day when you have some time to, to go back and look at the transcripts of the video of, this, of, of that speech. So the section that I'm going to share goes like this. Many things were gained as a result of these years of struggle. In 1964, the Civil Rights Bill came into, being came into being after the Birmingham Movement, which did a great deal to subpoena the conscience of a large segment of the nation to appear before the judgment seat of morality on the whole question of civil rights. After Selma Movement in 1965, we were able to get voting rights, the Voting Rights Bill 
and all of, things all of these things represented strides. But we must see that the struggle today is much more difficult. It's more difficult today because we are struggling now for genuine equality. And it's much easier to integrate a lunch counter than it is to guarantee a livable wage and a good solid job. It is much easier to guarantee the, the right to vote than it is to guarantee the right to live in sanitary and decent housing conditions. It is much easier to integrate a public park than it is to make genuine quality and integrated education a reality. And so today we struggle for something which says we demand genuine equality. And when Dr. King talks about genuine equality, it goes back to Jossie's question is, if we're not, if we're not, if equity is not about the willingness to give something up, then what is it about? Okay, so genuine equality is, is to me, when, when we talk about equity nowadays. So while people are, are, are streaming in, I always like to have student voices at the center, and if folks have been around for things that I've done, that's, that's what I really aim for. And so I'm gonna share with you a former Evergreen student who has asked himself the question on what does it mean to be white for him? And he's put together something in a very artistic way. And it's titled White Privilege Two. So I'm gonna ask for Andre to share with us one of Evergreen alumni's most recent um, pieces on his own self-examination as hopefully it leads to our own self-examinations over these next couple of hours and weeks and months and, and years to come. Are, are we good, Andre? Okay, cool. Andre Macklemore, um, it was a song that was released to, to last Thursday, and it's ginning up a lot of controversy for many reasons, and I would hope that you would explore that controversy as we leave, because we, we would really like to bring up the person um, <clears throat> who's going to help us continue to have the type of dialogues that we just heard Macklemore have with himself. Um, and Robin's with us here today, and Robin was placed onto my radar over the string of emails that went over our campus in September, right? Sparked by Aisha Harrison's request for us to come together which really was a request for us to really do something to develop teaching practices and pedagogies and frameworks to support um, students of color here on campus. And White Fragility, Robin D'Angelo, her work circulated our campus. And that conversation, which was very lively, a very lively and an offensive debate, suddenly stopped. So I think it's very fitting that we bring the person to our campus to help us continue a conversation that is long overdue. So I would like to welcome Robin D'Angelo up to the microphone. All right, thank you. Well, I want to start out by drawing your attention to the fact that I'm white, all right? So just notice and think about it. And part of being white is that that goes against all my conditioning um, and everything that I was taught about myself, right? Race wasn't what I had, that's what they had. And if there was an issue around it, 
that was their issue, but fortunately I was outside of it. Um, I'm at a place now in my work where I'm very clear that I see the world through a white frame of reference. I have a white experience, and I'm always coming from that position in a society in which race has profound meaning for our lives. And so I just want to be really clear that that's the position I'm speaking from, and that I'm going to be primarily speaking to other white people. Um, and also I want to say a few things about that. And first uh, is that as an insider to whiteness, I do have some understanding of it that people of color really can't have. Um, but as an insider to whiteness, people of color have an understanding of whiteness that I'll never have, right? Um, and so often uh, I do invite people of color to hold me accountable, to challenge my analysis, to deepen my analysis. I don't actually invite white people to do that. <laughs> what I invite white people to do is to reach for humility uh, and be willing to just grapple. Uh, and that right there is an interruption <laughs> to what it means to be white, is to have humility in the face of racism in the ways that we've been set up uh, to collude with it. And so I'll, I will map that out as I go forward. Um, but even though I am speaking as a white person primarily to other white people, this can still be very useful and often is really useful for people of color. Uh, because I'm going to name and admit to things that white people will rarely ever name and admit to, and that can help a little bit with the crazy making. <laughs> um, and you've got to navigate us, right? We are the problem. We are the gatekeepers. Um, and nothing in society gives any of us the information we need to have a complex, nuanced understanding of race. You know, people of color have to figure it out. They have to know my reality as well as, well as their own in order to navigate uh, and succeed. But, and, and I don't have to know people of color's reality. I could easily get to the top without ever really uh, understanding uh, another uh, point of view much less that I have a, myself, a racialized point of view, right? Because part of being white is to see oneself as just human, right? Just outside of race. And so I want to acknowledge that whether you're aware of it or not, the way that you hear me today is shaped by the body that I'm in. In other words, the very fact that I'm white shapes how you will hear what I have to say and the relationship of my race to, to yours or my racial position to yours. Um, and People of color uh, have been saying the things that I'm going to be saying. You know, I mean, I'm going to say it in my own way, in my own unique way, which I think is effective. But also, I have learned the vast majority of what I know from incredibly uh, patient and brilliant mentors of color. But the reality is we hear them differently. And so keep asking yourself, from what position do you hear me? Um, and, for, and if you have a, a reaction to what I say, and I hope that I'm really provocative and I make you really uncomfortable. <laughs> uh, because if I don't do that, I, I haven't done a good job, right? If I keep you comfortable, uh, that will, if you're white, well, the status quo is comfortable. So then we know that I've just reinforced it and I don't want to do that. Um, but I do want to acknowledge all, all those who have gone before me uh, who, who can't be heard in the same way. And this is a master's tools dilemma. Y'all know that uh, saying of Audre Lorde? Audre Lorde was a, a black uh, poet and activist. She's passed, but she had this phrase, the master's tools will never dismantle the master's house, which is how do you challenge a system from within the system? Right? So as I stand up here, and I am kind of an authority, if you will, uh, of my voice on racism, I am necessarily also centering my voice as a white person on racism. And this is a dilemma I haven't figured out how to get out of. Uh, but by God, if I can be heard, I'm going to use it. Um, and it's a kind of a both end. So those are my upfront acknowledgments. I have one more <laughs> disclaimer. I recognize that race is socially constructed. There's no true race uh, at the biological level as we've been taught. But as a social idea, it has profound meaning. And we can predict you know, people's life outcomes based on their race. So it's very real in that way. And for my very limited time with you, I'm going to be speaking about it in the big, big picture, right? White and people of color, right? The big binary, because I think on some level we can recognize that society is set up in that binary. 
Um, but in doing that, I'm also going to not do justice to all the complexity and nuance in those categories, right? So to, to have what I think of as racial fluency, you also have to break down this big category, people of color, and really understand how kind of different groups get as assigned different roles and then how we all kind of hook together. And I see you guys staring at that screen. Go, Am I up there on that screen? <laughs> ah, where's my slides? Ah, there we go. Thank you. Somebody was quick there. All right. So I do think about this as, you know, we can, we can listen to Malcolm or we can, we can maybe, maybe acknowledge white privilege, um, but it's still difficult, I think, for a lot of white folks to really see what role they play. Um, Eduardo Benio Silva has a wonderful book called Racism Without Racists. I mean, the title itself, right? I mean, we, nobody's racist anymore. Um, nobody, you know, really agrees with racism anymore, and yet we still have racism. In other words, by every single measure across every institution, our society is separate and unequal by race. So my question as a sociologist is how do we pull that off? How do we manage post-civil rights when racism is no longer acceptable, at least in certain explicit formats in certain public spaces? Because I see a lot of uh, race, racism that I see as explicit is still acceptable. But overall, uh, it's no longer acceptable, and yet we have these same outcomes. So that, that's what I uh, try to look at. And post-civil rights, it was pretty, pretty okay to just come out and say, yeah, white, white people are superior. My father certainly was very comfortable saying that. This was the great joke of Archie Bunker. Has anybody ever seen All in the Family? The great joke was he wasn't up with the times, right? His younger kids were always saying, Dad, you can't say that stuff anymore, right? Um, and so... It's transformed, but it's a, it's a brilliant and highly adaptive system. And it does adapt to challenges and incorporate those challenges. And so we have to be ever vigilant. We can't be complacent. And so I want to also look at how racism adapted to this challenge, that uh, this good-bad idea. So let's see, what should I... So today's dominant racial narrative, I am a former professor of education. So I, I just came back last year from a position in, in a teacher education program in Massachusetts. Uh, we had a huge education department. We kind of pumped out teachers. Uh, we, the program was 98% white, and we were 10 miles from a city that was 57% black and Latino. So the, the, the segregation on the East Coast is incredibly uh, explicit. Um, and so this 98% white teacher, you know, teacher uh, were going forth to teach in those schools, right? And so on the first day of class, I would have them take out a piece of paper and write their answers anonymously to a series of questions. And the questions were, how racially diverse were your schools and neighborhoods growing up? What messages have you gotten across your lifespan about race? And what are some of the ways in which your life has been shaped by your race? Uh, then I would collect these, and I would say, now I'm going to make some predictions, right? I hadn't seen them. They were in a big envelope, and I'd say, um, most of you grew up in white neighborhoods, went to white schools, have only, the only message you've ever gotten is that everybody's equal, and you really couldn't be bothered to write much more than a paragraph on this topic, okay? Um, and so what I'm about to show you is representative of the hundreds of these essays that I've collected from students who are juniors and seniors in, in college, right? It's close to being certified as highly educated by your institutions of higher learning and going forth to teach uh, in primarily black and Latino schools. Let's see, what do I, okay. My neighborhood growing up was not racially diverse at all. Every family in my neighborhood was also Caucasian. Throughout my time in school, I've been continually been taught that skin does not matter. Is this familiar to you? Right? So even if you may not say it, you may not be that naive and you know it's definitely reduced down to a nugget. This is the dominant racial narrative of the so-called younger generation that's less racist than my generation. Right? This is this is it right here. And this is said, again, in a context of extreme segregation, right? And I see a really big contradiction in this. Do you see the big contradiction? Right? Can you be taught that race doesn't matter in segregation? Like, how, how does that happen? And if race doesn't matter, why was there so much segregation? Right? 
Okay, so this is, this is kind of what we have to get our hands on today. Uh, and yet, at the same time, I've never met anyone who didn't have an opinion on race and racism. Have you? If you're not sure, bring it up at your next family dinner uh, and see how that goes. And go beyond one round. So ask a question, okay, and then ask maybe one more follow-up question and watch what happens, right? So uh, we have a lot of feelings. We have a lot of energy about this topic. Um, and yet, I'm going to say maybe my first provocative thing. We're, it looks like we're all adults in this room. I don't know you. I don't know your life experiences. You range from students to faculty to staff, right? Uh, you've, you've traveled. You've studied. You have friendships, relationships, right? You've lived your life. Um, but if you have not s devoted sustained study and focus and practice on this topic, your opinions are necessarily misinformed and superficial. And I'll put it another way. It's, you're necessarily ignorant on this topic. Now, how can I say such a thing when I don't know you? <laughs> because nothing in mainstream society gives you the information you need to have a nuanced understanding of race and racism. In fact, you can get a doctorate degree without getting good information. Okay? And everything I'm saying, I'm going to make a case for it as we unfold. But this is just to kind of push against this, yes, we all have opinions, but they're not informed. And this seems to be the one topic where we lose our humility on that. Right? So, so try to hold, hold it lightly. Let me stretch you a bit. And the first thing we have to do is have shared definitions. This is, this is one of the reasons why it's so hard to talk about these issues, is that we don't use the same terms in the same way. So we will often use prejudice, discrimination, and racism interchangeably. And they're not the same things, right? And so if we don't have a shared framework, we're probably not going to have a very effective or constructive discussion or dialogue. So quickly, prejudice is prejudgment. Uh, it's kind of what's in your head. Or, or maybe what's in your heart, how you think and feel. Um, all human beings have prejudice about other groups of human beings to which they don't belong, right? It's not humanly possible not to have prejudice. All right? And we, the, the challenge is that we're told it's bad to have prejudice, but it's just not possible not to have it, and we get it from everything. We absorb it across our lifespan. Um, your socialization didn't end with your parents, and it didn't end at you know puberty. It, it goes on across the lifespan. And so we're getting messages all around us 24-7, right? And we can make sense of these messages because they connect to messages that have gone before, OK? And discrimination is when we act on those messages, right? And it's actually not possible to not act on your prejudice, right? In other words, you cannot prevent yourself from discriminating based on your prejudice. And think about it like this. The way you see the world informs the way you respond to the world. And it can be very subtle, but it will manifest. So if I was taught that prejudice was hatred and discrimination was probably violence or, or slurs or that type of thing, which is why I didn't relate to it. Right? And I would be like, no way. I don't have a prejudice bone in my body. Uh, but when I understood it can be more subtle, lack of interest, granting some groups of people the benefit of the doubt and not others, right? Comfort with segregation, discomfort, hyper self-consciousness. All of those things are going to drive my reactions when I encounter somebody that I have those feelings or thoughts about, right? So the only way you can really challenge uh, or stop yourself from discriminating is to be able to identify your prejudice and then work with changing your understanding, right? Kind of re-educate yourself. All right, so everybody has prejudice, everybody discriminates. But when you back a group's, I see institution, I'm missing a T. <laughs> when you grab, uh, back a group's collective prejudice with control of all of the institutions, you transform it into something very different. Now the very society, the fabric, the default of the society will reproduce the discrimination without individual actors needing to do anything at all, right? Uh, it's not dependent on each individual person. The system is set up because the group that holds the power and the control of the institutions embeds its prejudice into the institutions, into the fabric or the very water of the society. So 
So you can think of it as prejudice uh, plus group power, prejudice backed by legal authority and institutional control. It gets embedded in all the institutions and also in cultural definitions of what's real, what's normal, what's beautiful, what's valuable, what's correct, who behaves correctly, right? Who's clean? Who cares about education? Who's beautiful? Whose stories aren't told? And whose stories are? And who gets to make those decisions, right? So there are different forms of systematic oppression, uh, often ending in the ism word, so sexism, racism, classism, heterosexism, anti-Semitism. These are all forms because uh, oppression is always about group relations, right? You kind of have a society, a hierarchical society in which we live is set up where groups are positioned as opposites, right? Rich, poor, uh, young, old, gay, straight, black, white, etc. right? We have these kind of binaries. And then um, one, of course, one side is seen as the norm, has power to basically control the society and then impacts the life of the other group, okay? And so I wanna give an example from sexism in order to illustrate and get us ready to talk about racism and kind of how that's embedded in our daily lives. So does anybody know what year women got the right to vote in the US? Can't tell. What, 1920, okay. Who gave it to us? You, you can say it. Who gave it to us? <laughs> okay. So outside of a violent and bloody revolution, which I'm not advocating, uh, is there any other way that women could have gotten the right to vote except for men to give it to us? No. Why not? Because we literally were not seated in the seats of institutional power. We, we didn't control the institutions. We couldn't pass policies, procedures, legislation. We couldn't grant it to ourselves, right? Doesn't mean an individual woman couldn't have some attitude towards men, uh, couldn't discriminate one-on-one -on -one against a man, but, but women as a group could not de deny men the right to vote. Women could not oppress men. And they couldn't grant themselves the right to vote. And that difference is critical. And if we take institutional power off the table and then we try to engage with what's going on, we're not going to be able to address it. Right? We have to look at the reality of institutional power. And clearly, there were men who were advocates. We wouldn't have gotten the right to vote if enough men. And by the way, it didn't happen the first time we asked. Right? We're talking decades of struggle. Um, but even those who were in the forefront of the struggle, those men still benefited from a system the system of patriarchy, right, that denied uh, women the right to vote. So when we talk about the uh, privilege, we're talking about this kind of automatic advantage that you're, you have just by being a member of that group. But also think about how every institution conspired uh, to deny women the right to vote. It wasn't just up to the House and the Senate, right? So uh, the male-dominated clergy preached from the pulpit, literally, that it was God's will. Try coming up against God's will when you're trying to make an argument. Um, you know, men who speak for God got to say what he wanted. Uh, so the clergy, uh, the psychiatrist, male dominated, wrote the studies that said women are inherently irrational. They cannot have this right. The medical doctors wrote the studies that said, look this stuff up, because I'm not making it up. If, wom if women think, the blood will flow upward to the brain, it will leave the uterus, and the babies won't turn out as well. Uh, and then ultimately, the military, right? If women were to rise up in the streets. So every institution works together, and that's really critical to understand, okay? So today, if men as a group wanted to take away our right to vote, could they? So just, I mean, even the way we have the conversation is part of how oppression works, right? It's so normalized, it's so taken for granted um, that it's really hard to see, right? Even when it's in front of us. So let's take a look here. These are the Fortune 500 CEOs, and I, I really do believe that this is the power, right? The 1% is the power. 98% male, U.S. Senate, 80% male. This is 2016. Come on, you know what's coming. House of Representatives, 82% male. Supreme Court, 66% male. Not trying to pick on the Republicans, but when I see something like this, it's going to go in my slideshow. Just take it in. Take it in. Patriarchy. 
presidents and presidency and vice presidency always 100% male. Okay? So I'll ask you again if they wanted to, could they? Okay, see that difference? Like 15, 20 seconds on basic statistics in front of all of us. So keep noticing all the ways that oppression works. The same groups that have controlled our institutions continue to control our institutions. And I'm confident that if Hillary becomes president, patriarchy will not end on that day. <laughs> Any more than it ended in 1920. And just to throw in some culture here, this was on last month's issue of Vanity Fair. Why late night TV is better than ever. Well, I guess from some viewpoint, right? Just patriarchy is so embedded, um, and, and you have to start to look at ideologies and all of the ways that we rationalize and justify. If you want to tease out how we can produce the same inequity and have people individually think that this isn't happening, okay? And by the way, uh, you know how a Facebook will send out these, on holidays, they send out like happy 4th of July, happy this, happy that. This actually came out um, this year on August 26th, so I, I suppose suffrage was passed on the 26th of August, 1920. Um, and then somebody did this. Which women got the right to vote in 1920? And that's another example of how oppression works, right? The dominant group's experience gets to stand in for everyone's experience, right? We were oppressed as women, but we were elevated as white women, right? There's not a, some universal woman's experience, right? It's very much uh, intersected with race and class, et cetera, right? Uh, think about the 4th of July. What are we celebrating on the 4th of July? Freedom, right? And what's the big date that this is connected to? What's the year? 1776? Let's just think about what was going on in 1776 in our country related to issues of freedom, right? Again, dominant group's experience stands in as, as everybody's. This is how oppression works. And, and it's like a relentless kind of slap in the face <laughs> to those who it doesn't represent, right? <clears throat> So racism is a form of institutional oppression. It is a system. It is, operates on multiple levels. And it, it's, thank you. <laughs> uh, and it results in an unequal distribution of everything between white people and people of color overall at the group level with whites as the beneficiary of that system. There is no reverse form of, of oppression. Right? So Marilyn Fry has a metaphor that I think is really beautiful of a bird cage. That when you put your face up to that cage, if I went all the way up and just pressed my face against it, I really wouldn't see the bars anymore, right? And I would be taking a very micro or myopic view of the bird and I'd be looking at the bird saying, what's the problem? Right, the bird is free, why doesn't the bird just fly? Look at little doors open, why doesn't it just fly away? Why don't they just do this X, Y, and Z? But if I step back, I begin to see these wires and then these wires and these wires. I begin to see the interlocking system that while it doesn't make it impossible for that bird to fly away, it, it enables us to predict that it's unlikely and they certainly have a huge mass network of barriers and challenges uh, that a bird outside that cage does not face. So let's look at what some of those are. Our institutions, our ideology, our history, our culture, microaggressions, threat of violence, isolation, internalized oppression, the burden of representation, invisibility, unacknowledged historical trauma. I can, I, I can speak for probably faculty and administration. If you are a person of color in an organization like this, which is very um, reflective of many, many other ones, you know what I mean when I say the burden of representation, hypervisibility, invisibility, right? All of these, all of this weight that you have to navigate that's not there for, for white people. So again, I'm just try, I'm trying to really, in order for us to understand how racism works, we've got to understand it as a system rather than as dependent upon intentions or self-image <laughs> or open-mindedness. 
And I actually usually make a joke at your expense, but, uh, which is the Evergreen College. Because I'll often say, when I started this work, I actually applied for a job as a diversity trainer. And I sincerely believe that my qualifications were that I shopped at PCC, uh, and I drove a Prius, and I went to Evergreen. I usually say that. I didn't go to Evergreen, but <laughs> I'm making a point. Um, I'm trying to poke fun at the progressive liberal because I truly believe that this was about open-mindedness and, you know, I'm lefty. And, and, and I actually think that the progressive, white, liberal, lefty like me is the hardest because the degree to which we think we understand this, we're going to put all our energy into deflecting any association with a system that we are saturated in. Right? And we're going to work really hard to distance ourselves rather than do the really deep personal work that it requires to challenge this socialization. So this is my metaphor, because I do love metaphors. And as I, you know, for a living, I talk to mostly white groups of people about race and racism. And I hear the same things all the time, right? Day in and day out, I hear the same claims. And I got this image of a dock, because it looks like that dock's just floating on top of the water, right? And that signifies the superficial kind of surface uh, aspects of these narratives. So let's see if you recognize any of them. I was taught to treat everyone the same. Sorry about this little delay. Um, I see people as individuals. I don't care if you're pink, purple, yellow, polka dotted. Has anybody ever heard some version of that? Okay, so if that's in your vocabulary, please remove it and never use it again, okay? Because people don't come in pinks and purples and polka dots and it's incredibly demeaning. It may not, you may not intend it to be demeaning, it's demeaning. Racism's real, let's talk about it. Right. Um, I was taught to treat everyone the same. Ever hear that one? No, you weren't. That's my reply to you. We're not taught to treat everyone the same. You cannot teach human beings to treat everyone the same. You can tell them to. I'm sure you were told to do that, but you can't do it. And so these these claims actually aren't doing what people often think they're doing, which is convincing other people that they don't have any issue. <laughs> it's, it's basically illustrating that you don't understand socialization, right? Okay. <clears throat> You're wondering why I'm looking down. I can see the thing down there. It's kind of cool. <laughs> so we can hear about as in the past. Doesn't have any meaning, everyone struggles. You probably heard all of these claims. My parents weren't racist, that's why I'm not racist, or my parents were racist, that's why I'm not racist. It doesn't really matter what goes in front of I'm not racist, <laughs> what needs to come is always I'm not racist. Okay. So and so just happened to be black. Uh, I need to tell you that, but now I need to tell you about the conflict that race has nothing to do with. And so I would also say to drop from your vocabulary, um, just happen to or has nothing to do with it. Because you, you cannot say, you cannot remove race from an interaction. You might not know what race has to do with it, but it has something to do with it. <laughs> it's in there. In this society, if there's a, 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 a conflict cross race, You've got to be willing to look at what, how race may have informed your responses. In the same way that if you have a conflict across gender, you can't remove gender and gender socialization from the way you respond to people. Okay. And then I was in the military. I have actually gone back and forth with people that insist that the reason they have no racism is because they were in the military, which kind of blows my mind. So even if I'll give them that you're all wearing green, I'll give you that, you all got on green, um, well, who do we recruit for the military? How do we recruit them? Who are you killing? And how did you get trained to kill them? Okay, this doesn't free you of racism. Now, if we're sophisticated, Northwest liberals, <laughs> we might not say that stuff, but here's what we say. I work in a very diverse environment. I have people of color in my family. So I want to ask you, have any of you ever heard a white person in a discussion of racism say some version of, I work in a very diverse environment or I have people of color in my family? Okay. So someone who says this to you is giving you their evidence, right? That's their evidence. Uh, what is it their evidence of in their mind? 
that they're not racist, right? That's their evidence. So if that's their evidence, how do they define racism? And actually, this has been really useful for me. If I can figure out what's under the surface, what they're drawing from, then I know what to speak to, okay? So how does somebody define um, racism that would get, use this to say that they're not, they don't have it? Okay. Yeah, and, and I think about it like this, conscious dislike. A racist doesn't like people of color. So a racist could never tolerate a person of color in their family, right? And clearly, I, I love a person of color, so I couldn't be racist, okay? So again, it do, this person doesn't understand the power of implicit bias or that there will still be racial dynamics in the relationship. Uh, here's my example, and I, I'm trying to be thoughtful about not um, reinforcing kind of cis supremacy. This is my new le learning curve. But how many of you are cisgendered and in opposite sex relationships? Okay, so I'm gonna ask the, the women in the room, cis women. The moment you're, you got a man in your life, right? That's what basically, you raise your hand because you got a man in your life, all right. <laughs> So the moment he fell in love with you, his sex sexism disappeared, correct? <laughs> He's cured, there, he has no sexism because he loves you. No, okay. Are there any gender dynamics at all in your relationship? Okay, so we can see this so clearly with gender and I'm telling you, yes, I could fall in love with a person of color, that does not free our relationship of, of racism or racial dynamics or all the ways that our socialization is gonna interact and we're gonna struggle. Okay, and then I work in a very diverse environment, I guess because a racist couldn't tolerate somebody three cubicles down that's a person of color, or sometimes I hear, I used to live in New York, that's why I'm not racist. It's like, oh, you used to walk by people of color. Okay, so <laughs> a racist just couldn't do it. A racist just couldn't live in New York, okay. And it is, I do want you to laugh, it, it is ridiculous, right? Um, and I'm hoping that you still can recognize some of it in your own consciousness. I don't want you to distance yourself, but I think we so seldom go under the surface and think about what are you really saying, right? What, what is the meaning-making framework you're drawing from, okay? Oh, this one's real big in Seattle. I live in the most diverse zip code in the US, 98118. Has anybody ever heard this? Seattleites love this one. It's Columbia City, which is no longer the most diverse zip code in the US, right? Um, I used to live in New York. My children are so much more open. I actually want to be sensitive to this. This is a very hard one. Um, but unfortunately, children by three or four know the racial order. And what's the racial order? It's better to be white. All children get that message, all of us get that message 24-7. The constant message of our society is that it's better to be white. And that doesn't mean I uh, accept the message consciously, but I have to fight it because it comes at me 24-7. I will show you many, many images that illustrate what I'm saying, but to just say, oh, I don't pay attention to it is not gonna exempt you from it. Right? You have to be able to read the message in order to resist it. And so children do internalize the racial order, and this romanticization of them just causes us not to equip them with what they need, right? When we just want to say they're, they're innocent of race. I mean, they might be born innocent, but it doesn't last very long. I already know all this. So this I, we don't like how white our neighborhood is, but we had to move here for the schools. And I, find, I just find that really disingenuous. Yes, we do like how white it is. It's, uh, it's a good neighborhood, right? Why, why is it a good neighborhood? This is, this is new, this is a form of, of coded racism and white flight. We do it every day, we all know what we're talking about, and it's, it's a good neighborhood and it's a good school because it's white, in the white mind, okay? So, you got to go under the surface and think about, okay, what are we drawing from? And that's what I want to map out in the, in the next part of this presentation, right? Now that we've kind of laid down the difference between individual prejudice and a system, um, so I want you to reflect for just a moment on, on a couple of questions. And the first one is to think about um, 
how racially diverse was your neighborhood or neighborhoods if you moved frequently growing up? <laughs> and what messages do we get about race from our neighborhoods? Okay. I can just tell you that if you are white across the United States, the vast majority of white people's answer to this question is, my neighborhood growing up was not racially diverse, right? We might be able to name, okay, you know, over on this one block over, there was an Indian family and one, you know, we can map out where everybody was, but overall, they're primarily white neighborhoods. And put another way, the vast majority of white people in the U.S. grow up in segregation, racial segregation. Okay. The only exception to that, if you are white and you did not grow up in a racially segregated neighborhood, you were probably poor, urban and poor or working class. So pretty much the only exception, and you probably no longer live in those neighborhoods because upward mobility takes us away, and we don't tend to maintain those friendships. Right? We know that if we're going to succeed, we're going to move away. Okay. Um, When's the first time, just think for a minute, when's the first time you had a teacher of the same race as you, or races if you're multiracial, and how often did that happen? And when's the first time you had a teacher of a different race than you, and how often did that happen? And why might that matter? Well, across the U.S., the, the most patterned answer to that question is if you're white from the time you began, and you can get through graduate school without ever having a teacher of color. Or you could have one, maybe two. You could name them my third grade Spanish teacher, this type of thing, right? Or not until college, if, if at all. So if you are white, you pretty much relentlessly saw yourself reflected and continue to see yourself reflected in the front of that room. And if you are a person of color, rarely, if ever, have you seen yourself reflected in the person in front of that room. And I will just leave you to think about why that matters, right? Um, and let's back up to the messages we get about race from living in segregation, right? And think about it. Um, you've got to make sense of the world as a, as a child. So you know, at, by probably five, all of us know, all white people, pretty much white kids, know that people of color exist, right? You know, we don't really know any, and they don't really live here, but we know they exist. So where are they, right? Why don't they live here with us? Everybody's equal. Why do we live apart? Where do they live? Is the place where they live a good place? Was it a place I was encouraged to know and explore? Or in many, many ways, was it a place where the messages were not to, not to go? Sketchy, dangerous, etc. There are really, really deep messages uh, in segregation. Because the, the practice of our lives is much more powerful than anything we say, right? When we say people are equal, but live apart. And with teachers, you know, teachers are the holder of knowledge. They're um, our role models. And as someone who just came out of teacher education, uh, the vast majority of teachers answer question one and question two the way I just mapped out. Most teachers, uh, it's about 83, it's between 83 and 93 nationwide of the teaching, the K through 12 teaching force is white. It's getting whiter, not less. And our uh, schools are almost back to pre-Brown versus Board of Education levels of segregation. Okay? <laughs> um, and that, those teachers answer those questions similar to most, most everybody else. And that doesn't mean they're, they're bad or they're more racist than any other group. It means that is a profoundly homogeneous <laughs> environment. Um, and so where do we get our understandings of people of color if we don't really know them? Well, we get them from really problematic sources, right? Uh, MSNBC, lockdown, cops, Jerry Springer, jokes, omissions, movies, right? But now, what's so 
powerful about this is now I'm in the position to socialize everyone's children. I get to decide who's smart, who's capable, who's well-behaved, who's respectful, who belongs in special ed, who should be punished for what, and on every measure you see the outcome. The school to prison pipeline, Seattle's in big trouble <laughs> over their outcomes. And so it's not about individual people and their intentions. It's about this segregation, and then what we've absorbed, and then the way that manifests in our practices. Right? And then you add, um, make it so bad to be uh, to be to have racist ideas and attitudes that no one wants to look at it. That was a clever adaptation. <laughs> okay. So I want to show you an image. Uh, I love images, and so um, I'm going to have a lot of images now in this next part because. Um, I, I try to just grab them that I see circulating around, freeze one, you know, here's, this represents this concept, I'll freeze it, and then uh, we can think about how it kind of represents all that comes before it. And so this is my image to capture this kind of question number one and two. This is the College Jeopardy Champion Playoffs. Uh, these are our best and brightest, again, certified as highly educated. I mean, they're, they're college champions, so they're pretty smart. And this is the board at the end of the champion round. And as we can see, there's a column that not one of them touched. Obviously, the hardest, none of them wanted to lose. For me, that would be astrophysics, <laughs> chemistry, right? It, to be really honest, it could be algebra. But let's see what it is. And I, I don't really know how to capture the profundity of this. If we don't know our history, we cannot address racism. It is the bedrock of this country. It is hundreds and hundreds of years of plunder. Um, it, it is as critical to how I come to be standing here as to understand how African Americans in this case are standing where they're standing. It is our shared history. It shapes all of our identity. And the more we lose touch with it, the less we're going to be able to address this. I just think that uh, captures that. <clears throat> so Joe Fagan is a sociologist who has a concept of the white racial frame. Um, and I, I love his concept. It's kind of my image of the pillars that are propping up the dock is kind of my version of the white racial frame. And it's the, it's the framework through which whites make racial meaning, it includes everything, not just uh, what we say, but uh, perceptions, interpretations, actions that position whites as superior and that are passed down and reinforced uh, throughout society. So let me show you some of the images that I think represent the white racial frame. You know, again, you don't have to read Vogue magazine. You know, the, this affects all of us um, in just the second it takes to, to look at it. And it, it, it affects who we're attracted to, how we see ourselves, and of course, what position we're in in relation to these images. And, and anyone who says that I don't pay attention to ads just told me, <laughs> uh oh, uh, because it's a billion dollar industry that depends on you not paying a lot of attention, right? <clears throat> This is an ad I was on a Delta airline and I saw this in the magazine and had to have it. So uh, the first thing that struck me about it was the hierarchy. It's just so obvious, right, the racial hierarchy. So you have your white women in front wearing green and with red hair. You have your Asian women in the middle in yellow. You have your black women in the back in, in brown. Okay, so that's the first thing. That's kind of what I noticed. But as I looked at it more closely, it's an ad for a purse. Uh, look at the hands of the black women. They don't even have the purse, right? It's just that kind of passive, empty hands way in the back. And I'm just saying, this, this one ad symbolizes kind of the relentless messages that we get. Here's an ad for Intel. Maxim, uh, multiply computing performance and maximize the power of your employees. This is six shirtless black men bent at his feet. Look at the body language. Um, you know when you, nowadays you can't read any news, anything online without seeing all those 
flashing, read this story, read this story. So I was on CNN, and one of them is, was most beautiful women in the world or across the world. And I'm like, OK, got to check that out. So representing South Africa, which is 92% black, that is white supremacy to me. <laughs> And, and by the way, uh, there was not one Asian woman in this spread who are the majority of all the women in the world. Yeah. So I think the most brilliant and clever adaptation of racism over time is the binary, that you make racism so bad that, uh, it, that to suggest complicity with it is to, to give a deep moral offense. Um, so we know, we know that a racist is ignorant and bigoted and prejudiced and mean-spirited, old, southern, drives a pickup truck, get a little classism in there, uh, and not racist, you know, educated, progressive, open-minded, well-intended, young, northern, right? Think about any defensiveness you've ever encountered in a white person or you have felt in yourself, if you're white, around racism, any conflict, any whatever, dinner party gone horribly wrong, it's rooted in this. And when you see incidences in the news, you're going to get people that are going to defend someone, and they're going to say, he's a really nice person. Because to be a nice person and to be complicit with racism is mutually exclusive. In this moment, I, I, I'm telling you, it's not mutually exclusive, but that's how we've set it up. Um, I just can't believe how effective it is. So we have to get rid of that and just like, it's, it's not about good or bad, it is about the water. So I'm gonna answer that last question on those three, some of the ways in which your race has shaped your life by using uh, my life as an example, that's my book. And the first way is that I was born into a society in which I belong. Virtually every situation, every and any situation deemed normal, neutral, or valuable, I belong. And everything I'm about to say in this section could not be said by a person of color in our society. I belong in that faculty meeting. I belong in that church service, that block party, dealing with my daughter's teachers, her camp counselors, that wedding. How many of you have been at a wedding that if it wasn't 100% white, it was pretty close? Incredible psychic freedom. Never underestimate the power of belonging. It's in my bones, it's in my muscles, it's in my posture, it's in what I reach for, what I see is available to me. It's what I care about and what I don't care about, right? Belonging. Uh, certainly represented in the government. Let's look at race. We looked at gender. They're hard to separate, but racially, U.S. Senate is 93% white. House of Representatives, 83. Supreme Court, 66. Uh, I was raised Catholic, and there's a lot of iconography in Catholicism. I don't know that there's a more powerful image than God. So this is what I saw when I looked up. There's God creating man. There's Jesus, who, of course, historically was a man of color. There's Moses. There's Mary. And, you know, don't get me wrong. As a little girl, I didn't look up and go, God is white. But that's the power. It's just a relentless, relentless reflection. And keep thinking about what it would be not to see that, not to be on that side of it. Well, whites are the norm for humanity, right? We're just people. You know, there's film directors, and then there's black film directors. There's authors, and then there's Asian authors, right? We're just people. So I was thinking, how do I, how do I represent that? So I found these. You guys have all seen these in some class? Well, here's a close-up. Even with their skin off, they're white. <laughs> and there's Adam and Eve, the first human beings. You know, we know the first humans came out of Africa. Constant messages that it's better to be white. Nobody misses this message. So let's see, best hair. We have Halle Berry in here, but of course her hair is straightened. That's a, that's a math book that I actually found in the faculty supply co closet in my uh, college of education. So the first thing I fell out over was the gendering of math, like how awful, like please. And then I thought, oh my goodness, they're teaching in Springfield, Massachusetts, and all the little girls are getting that. Right?
This little girl has been dubbed world's most beautiful girl. You might not be aware of this, but this is going on out there. Uh, and I, you know, I think it's uh, really problematic on many levels, but again, the whiteness, the ideal, right? This is on a science website right now. What would a scientifically perfect face look like? And I apologize for this, but this ran in Psychology Today in 2011. Notice the pseudo-scientific kind of grid on her face. Like that somehow this is natural, that whiteness is superior and desired across the world outside of colonialism. I was racially affirmed throughout my childhood, and I'm going to use images from today's childhood so we can't distance ourselves. Do you guys realize how mega blockbuster Frozen is worldwide? It's just blown off every record possible. I've seen so many little girls of color with these backpacks and these coats. I'm going to repeat it. No one misses the message, it's better to be white. If you aren't actively resisting it, it seeps, it's seeped in there. Right? This is Ayla Jones. She's a little girl that was killed in a police shootout in her home in Detroit. And what's particularly poignant about this picture for me is that she's posed there in front of those Disney princesses. And because childhood is so gendered, <laughs> let's do the boys. Okay, um, unless you were homeschooled, probably all of us have been deeply shaped by films. Uh, I think um, those who write and direct films are our cultural authors. Uh, all of our understandings of romance, sexuality, normalcy, friendship, family, conflict, adventure have all been shaped by film. Um, and the vast majority, of course, of our cultural authors, and in this case, actually, not just white, but upper class men, and what's problematic about that is, the, again, the homogeneity of that group, that upper class white men are the least likely, because of that, is, that privileged status, the least likely to have authentic cross-racial relationships, right? To truly know people of color. But they get to represent the other in, in all of our minds, right? <clears throat> I would also I have to sigh. Um, if you're white and you love a movie about race, let it be a red flag. Just trust me. Red flag. I loved it. Uh-oh. Because <laughs> usually it's reinforcing some very cherished sense of yourself in relation to race. And usually what it's reinforcing is that you're the good white. Because these films often um, have the good whites and the bad whites. Right? And um, that's just such a non-constructive setup. I mean, it's constructive for upholding racism. It's not constructive for us understanding it in ourselves, OK? And I just think this picture right here pretty much captures the blind side, highly acclaimed, Academy Award winning film. This is a little boy trying to teach this man how to play football. And he never can understand it. So the little boy just appeals to his instincts, <laughs> OK? And it reminded me a lot of that picture. You see what I mean when I say these, all of these connect and those tropes are, are familiar, right? They've gone before. This is a scene from the blind side, right? These relentless images of, uh, well, that's his neighborhood in the film, right? And then there's the white family that saves him. See the abundance, the benevolence, the Christianity. Uh, there's two girls of color in here, but do you see them? They're hard to see because they're on each end, which is usually what it is. If you get any, any people of color in these kinds of things, you get one or two, and they're always to the side. And in this case, it was very explicit. They're on the very end. I'm just, I want you to see the relentlessness of it. I want you to see, see the water and how much deeper it is than whether you tell or don't tell racist jokes, right? 
that in fact, if you, if you aren't paying attention and resisting it, it can only inform your reactions to the world and your responses. And when you do get, here's Latinas, when are we gonna get some Latinas on TV? Well, they're devious maids. I mean, it's just so, I mean, they're not only sexualized, but of course they're maids, right? They're Latina. Let's do Lord of the Rings. How many of you have seen it? All right, 12 Academy Awards, worldwide, sensation. And I'd go to these cocktail, my, my partner's really into the film festivals and stuff, so we'd go to these cocktail parties around this time and people would probably talk about Lord of the Rings and I'd be like, oh my God, the white supremacy in Lord of the Rings was deafening. <laughs> and then like suddenly like everybody's gone, right? Like, you know, and I'm standing there. And then all the way home, my partner and I are fighting because he's like, why did you have to say that? You make people uncomfortable. Now, I, I don't say this to put my partner down because I clearly love him, um, but just that pressure, right, not to break white solidarity. White solidarity is the unspoken agreement that we will keep each other comfortable around our racism and we will pr protect white privilege, basically, and I broke it. <laughs> um, and so there's a lot of pressure not to do that, right? Now you're gonna make them feel bad because they liked the film. You, I want to get to where you're thrilled that you didn't notice the racism in, in Lord of the Rings, because now you know what you didn't notice and where, what you need to work on, right? That that's actually, you enthusiastically want to identify your blind spots, not get all defensive and try to like rationalize why it wasn't racism at all. And I'll show you what I'm talking about. Uh, so there are many creatures in this film. There are elves, there are hobbits, there are the men, that's what they're called. There's one woman in that group. There's an elf queen, and there's a wizard. Okay, so many crowd scenes, 100% white, not one single brown token face in any crowd, right? Harry Potter will give you a couple brown token faces, right, in the cafeteria. So nothing, so I'm sitting there like kinda, you either wanna go to the movies with me or you don't wanna go to the movies with me, right? So I'm like, oh, I can't, you know, I'm getting kinda fidgety. And then they're literally trying to get to the White City, you know, that's what they call it, the White City, and they're trying to escape the Dark Lord of Mordor, right? And then um, we have our hero, and then the evil wizard makes monsters, and the monsters liter literally come up from the mud and the dirt, which is a very old biblical story. This is it, this is, this is Lord of the Rings. These are the monsters. I, I don't, it's so, clear and yet people get really white people get really defensive it, you know you ruined it for me or does that mean I'm bad because I liked it it's just like again got to have media literacy but this is constant this is just one example um, so most of us grew up with these shows, and they, they take place across the decades, and they're all about ideal friendship, right? So there's Seinfeld, which is the 80s, and then um, Sex and the Cities is, was the 90s, and Friends was in the 2000s, and that's Gossip Girl, and then Girls is a kind of hot show now, right? Again, every one of these shows is about ideal friendship. Um, every one of these shows takes place in New York City arguably the most racially diverse city in the U.S., and everyone is 100% white. And this is, again, the relentless message that there is no loss here, that ideal kind of friendship circles don't need to be inclusive, even in the midst of diversity. And keep thinking what it would be like if you're, if you're white. I'm sure I don't have to say this to people of color in the room. Just this, the relentlessness of it, and, and that we don't notice it, or, or that we're not concerned by it. And these proud people created an app called the Sketch Factor. And this is an app that when you go to a new city and you use it, it will tell you what, which neighborhoods to avoid, where the sketchy neighborhoods are. We all know what we're talking about. Sketchy neighborhoods are, are black and brown and poor. So now, from the convenience of our phones, we can police these, these boundaries, these borders, right? Um, in the same way that we know what a good school is in a good neighborhood, right? In very large part, it's simply measured in terms of its racial makeup. So I want to end uh, by saying that probably the most profound way that my life has been shaped by my race 
uh, is that I could be born into, and by the way, that photograph was taken in zip code 98118. And I, I want to really spell out right here when I, what I mean when I say I could be born into, right? So where my mother could deliver, uh, what kind of nutrition was available to her, what kind of education was available to her, what kind of health care was available to her, how she was treated when she interacted with the medical institution, who delivered me, and who came in and took the garbage out that night. Right? I was born into a racial hierarchy from the moment I opened my eyes. Right? So that I could be born into, that I could learn, I could play, I could worship, I could study, I could love, I could work, and I could die in racial segregation, and not one person who's ever taught or mentored me has ever conveyed that I had lost anything. I'm going to say this a few times in a few ways because this goes well beyond white privilege. It goes to my psychosocial development was inculcated in the water of white supremacy. This is what this is, white supremacy. White and whiteness as superior. Right? And we do child development. Now I want you to Look at that, and I want you to think about a couple things, right? Child development theory, right? Because we, it's like that's universal, right? <laughs> that that my development and a child of color in that water would be would be similar. Or we're objective about race; they they aren't. Or we'll decide who's the most qualified, right? So. I, if I just follow the trajectory that my loving parents laid out for me in my good school, in my good neighborhood, in my good co college degree, in my good career, I could easily have few, if any, authentic, sustained relationships with people of color. Or think about it, you could easily, a white person could live their lives without really ever having authentic relationships. Maybe you lucked out because you met some people at work, but if they don't come into your orbit, you won't have them, right? And no one ever suggested I had lost anything. That's internalized superiority. The essential message in segregation is that there's no inherent value in the perspectives or experiences or relationships with people of color. And so you get to my age, you get to my place in life, and I'm not even going to notice they're missing. I'm going to have trouble taking in those perspectives, if they're different than mine, right? Because everything I've ever done, you know, we've got this covered. What do we, we can think about. We can solve all the problems. We can think in isolation. Um, and and I'm, wa I'm what's wanting you to get the profundity of segregation and that every other, every time we say that a neighborhood or a school is good, and, and basically we're using uh, the absence of people of color to, to, to measure that, what are we saying? How, how could we say it's a good neighborhood if it's segregated? Right? Um, and again, this isn't about being good or bad people. But it's about waking up and taking responsibility and addressing it at a very kind of root level. Right? And it's lifelong and ongoing. Um, it, I'll never be free of this because even if we're kind of seeing it right now, as soon as we walk out that door, everything out there will push us not to see this, not to name this, right? Or you, you've, you know what I'm talking about, right? And so you have, to, you have to ask yourself, what am I going to put in place to, to keep supporting me, to see this and to care about this and to interrupt my complacency and to keep it on the table and to not give up when it gets hard, which I, of course I can do. And it will get hard if it's getting real. <laughs> okay. And I'm hoping you're not, usually I um, have a cordless mic, so I'm walking around. <laughs> so this might come across more strongly if I had been moving. But I'm hoping you're noticing I'm a pretty empowered person, right? Okay. <laughs> My point is, I don't feel guilty. I'm not trying to make people feel guilty. I mean, if guilt motivates you, I'm okay with it. Okay. Uh, and as a good Catholic, it does motivate me. If guilt paralyzes you, then uh-uh, you can't indulge in it, because then it's just an excuse, right? I just, it's just that um, 
it's incredibly transformative and liberating to just start from the premise that yes, I have a, deeply, a deep investment in racism. Of course I do. It's all I've known and it works for me. And, and I don't want that, right? That's not okay with me. And if I'm gonna sleep at night, I've got to actively, intentionally be always trying to interrupt it. The default is racism. The default is the reproduction of racism. That's what I tell my teachers. You just go up there, pick up the curriculum, and do your job exactly how it was laid out for you. You'll perfectly reproduce it, right? Um, there's, it depends on us just being nice and open. And I'm actually at a place in my work where yes, there are police executions and police murders, and those are extreme and brutal. And, um, but I think the most hostile, toxic environment for people of color every day is unexamined whiteness. Because this comes out of my pores. It comes out in how I respond when you want to talk about race. It comes out in my self-image, right? It comes out in what I call, and we're going to do this in part two, <laughs> white fragility. Right? I've just, I'm always racially comfortable, and I haven't had to build the skills or the capacity to endure a challenge to that. And so we end up kind of acting like bullies around this stuff, right? Um, so all of that to say, we've, we've, you know, it is very transformative, and um, it's the most stimulating growth I've ever been on, right? And so I don't feel guilty, but I do feel responsible, right? <clears throat> So if we go back to those pillars and we think about what is propping up new racism, what allows us to have so much racial inequity and yet feel individually like we're, you know, we're okay, um, is this, this idea that it's an either or proposition, right? The good, bad binary. Individualism, this idea that we're all unique and separate and outside of socialization and can be exempt from these messages just because we want to be. Um, universalism is kind of the opposite. You know, we're all, you've probably heard these used interchangeably when you try to talk to white people about racism. Why can't we all just be individuals? Or why can't we all just be the same? Uh, and we use them interchangeably because the goal is to get race off the table. <laughs> uh, and so, yeah, on some level, yes, we're all unique. And on some level, yes, we're all the same. But we don't live in the world where that's at play. So we're going to have to when it comes to racism, we can't go there, right? That we're, that we're all the same or that we're all different. Internalized superiority and investment, often unconscious in this system. And segregation, desired segregation. Uh, segregation that we kind of, it, it, all, all white spaces are primarily, white spaces are racially active spaces. They're not free of race, and there's only race if people of color come in. Every moment that we interact in, in segregation, we're being reinforced in, in that, right? Um, so we have to start seeing segregation as living, breathing, affecting us, right? Um, so I think I'm going to end with, I'll just put this up here. And I have no idea where we are on time, so Felix, huh? Oh, cool, perfect. I did it in an hour. <laughs> so we do a little Q and A. So let's do this. Just loosen you up a little bit. Turn to the people around you. Kind of, um, if you're white, please don't focus on the one thing you don't agree with, right? Oh, well, that's you know, Lord of the Rings was 12 years ago, you know. And we know that things have changed in those 12 years. As long as I brought that up, let me just say, if you saw it, it doesn't matter when it was made, right? And, it's, and it doesn't matter when you saw it. It's all connected, OK? So what I would say to the white folks when you turn to your neighbor is try to really connect it to yourself and your own life, right? It's really easy to kind of focus on everybody else's stuff. So how, what do you, where do you see this in yourself? If you're a person of color, absolutely any reflection you want to make about whiteness since you got to deal with it all the time. So go ahead and turn to your neighbor and just kind of talk a little bit. OK, welcome back. Lord knows I hate to interrupt a discussion on racism, but 
um, grappling, insight, connections, love to hear what you're thinking or what you want more help with or etc. <laughs> and they have a mic they'll run. Oh, there we go. Oh, she's... <laughs> So I was hoping. Uh, okay. So I was hoping you could talk more about white flight versus uh, gentrification versus segregation. Se segregation. Gentrification versus segregation. Is that what you said? Yeah. White flight. Kind of. Yeah. I mean, in a condensed way, I'd say when we want that space back, we gentrify it and take it back. Right, but it leads, there's a process, like a transition process, but it always leads to segregation. And, and I need to say, you know, we do, we do like some kinds of diversity, right? Like we like that Montessori school with the international students, you know, we want a little bit of that for our kids, but the right kind and the right amount, right? We don't really want black and, black and Latino, basically, people in certain numbers, you know, um, in, in our own backyard, right, w it, that we have a history and a relationship with, right? So many white people are much more comfortable with African immigrants than they are with African Americans because of that deep history between those groups and the ways that that history is carried in our bodies, et cetera. So th I'm just riffing off your question here. <laughs> um, I, I don't know what else to say for I think it all leads to, I mean, um, separation, but there's some crossovers. You know, for a while though, we all wanted to be in the suburbs, but now cities are desirable again, and so we come back. Is, is that what you're asking me? Yeah. How do you get rid of segregation without having white flight and without having um, gentrification? Oh, I see what you're Maybe saying. Maybe that. How I do you think that um, we often true integration where we're actually like um, connecting with the people with people of color in those environments that we're supporting the businesses that are owned by people of color but we often move into those neighbors where we don't truly integrate with them and we don't support them that's that's the key we come in but we remain separate and then those businesses don't flourish and then they get driven out right um, yeah Um, real quickly, before I ask my most pertinent question, Steve Wilson from Smith says hello. <laughs> okay. Um, my main <laughs> question is, uh, how do non-black people, um, allies, uh, help like Black Lives Matter and other organization, organizations with similar goals without, in a sense, taking the spotlight off of the actual black people? God, I, I'd probably answer that. The way I would answer it is that and, um, is the answer, and that I would ask, I don't feel like as a white person I can answer that question, right? I would ask, I would go to people who are involved in Black Lives Matter and ask. Um, and often, though, what they say is work on yourselves. We don't need your help, we don't need you taking over. I mean, either do some menial labor for us, um, cook, take care of the kids, uh, or just work with your own people and raise their consciousness, right? Um, but it's always key to ask, yeah. And I think that's a, that's a point. Um, Felix is wanting me to leave you with some questions. And I think for people of color um, to really look at how white supremacy sets you up to be divided against other groups of color, right? And that often uh, Asian heritage people are used as a wedge between white people and, and black people. And so how can you be allies and instead of buying into kind of that that wedge, how can you really kind of build those coalitions within that kind of people of color movement? Yeah. Hi. Hi. Um, I had two questions. Um, my first one um, is, um, as white people, it with the um, prompt from um, got Jossie Ross um, mm. about what should we give up as white people, <laughs> I'm wondering, what you, um, you think about that, and I can wait to ask my second question if you like. 
So he left you with the question is what would you have to give up? Yeah. Um, the kinds of things I think we have to give up are, are things like um, our, our, sen our sense of ourselves as central to everything, right? It, 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 and um, that narcissism, that self-focus, that it, it, I keep thinking of it in terms of the opposite. Like we have to reach for humility. We have to be willing to listen. We have to be willing to not know. Right to 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 receive feedback and to sit and not not necessarily understand what we've done, but be, but know that it, if you give me that feedback, then I'm going. I can sit with it and I can look at it, and I might not ever get it, but I don't need to get it for it to be valid. These are all the things that we do, right? When you can explain that to me in a way that I understand and that I deem legitimate, then maybe I'll consider taking in the feedback you're giving me. Um, but until you can do that, then I'm, I'm not going to. So I guess all the things I'm talking about are, are, are skills about how to be with each other, how to hear each other, how to get out of the center. <laughs> um, and they're, they're not so much, I think we often think of it as, oh, I have to give up my house, or I have to give up these concrete kinds of things. But I have to change the institutions, which means I have to give up white solidarity. I have to give up comfort. Um, I have to give up knowing. I have to be in that really awkward place of not knowing, not understanding. Right? Those are huge stretches. Thank right? you. Yeah. Uh, and that flows really well into my ah. second question. Um, so in the space of not knowing um, and in, uh, I think that using relationships, as you mentioned earlier um, in response to this person's question, that that's like one of the best ways to change white supremacy is by, as a white person, talking to other white people. Um, and so one person in my life is my dad, who um, grew up in Wallingford in Seattle, is a white liberal, um, and still um, insists on that he has a right to use racial slurs. Um, he's like an artist and thinks it's his job to push the boundaries. And my brother and I have had like many conversations with him and he thinks that we're like, he just gets really defensive. Um, and in your talk you mentioned um, that you don't like, you don't, you don't want other white people to call you out and then you gave an example of you calling other white people out mm. and then you said that you want people of color to call you out and I'm wanting to hear your response because it sounds kind of problematic to me that you're putting the um, job back on people of color to educate you and um, maybe you're saying that you're at a level where you don't want like normal white people to call you out or something. I'm just wanting to know what your um, opinion is on that as someone who like tries to do the same thing and really strives to not look good um, and is willing to feel like uncomfortable so, yeah. That's yeah, no, I actually appreciate you giving me the opportunity to clarify <laughs> what I meant. Um, I do sincerely believe that if, if you're white and you have not thought deeply about this, that you're, you're misinformed. And I don't believe that um, everybody's opinion's equal, right? So uh, I, I challenge guidelines in discussion groups that say, you know, um, speak your truth and affirm everybody. Because if your truth is that you're colorblind, I, I'm just not gonna affirm that because that's not possible, right? And so what I'm doing in that opening is trying to push white people on that, on that arrogance, right? Um, and, and have them listen from a place of openness and humility. And I've learned to have to do that because when it comes to this topic, we, we, we tend to engage um, with the goal of protecting our worldview. So what she says that I agree with, I, I like that, and what she says that I don't agree with, and then we leave and we're, the, we're thinking the same way that we did. So what I'm asking, it's not like you can't, I'm not, it's not that I'm asking white people not to question me, but to, to grapple to understand what I'm saying before you negate or reject what I'm saying, right? Um, and what I think I'm doing, and I may not have come across, uh, with people of color is, it, it, the very fact that I'm giving kind of different options is like kind of radical, right? It's like people call you're free to challenge me. White people, no, you have to sit there, right? That right there interrupts the status quo, 
right? And notice that I say, if you choose to, right? I say, people of color, you can deepen me, you can challenge me if you choose to do so. And I'm not inviting white people to do the same thing. I'm inviting you to be, to, to grapple. So those, those are my intentions in that. Um, and yeah, if I, if I know that somebody's worked really hard and, you know, I'm, I'll go there with them, but a lot of times people are not, I don't know how to say this, but, you know, it's kind of risky. Um, not really qualified to engage at, at a certain level. It's time to listen. It's like, here's my analogy. I have an opinion of the sky, right? I've seen it every day in my life, right? And I, I get up every day and I look at it and then I think about what I'm gonna wear and you know, it influences me and I like it best when it's twilight. I think that's the coolest color and well, I went camping with my dad and he would point out the constellations so I have some knowledge of the constellations, right? You know, everybody has some kind of lay understanding but not to compare myself to Neil deGrasse Tyson, but if Neil deGrasse Tyson comes in the room, I'll probably hold, a <laughs> he's got more knowledge on it. And this is a topic that white people just lose that, and they, they just want to engage with, um, without having to do a lot of deep thinking. So that's where I'm coming from, trying to um, position them more openly. Did, did that help? It did, okay, good. <laughs> Thanks. Oh. What color do you consider your skin to be? Oh, what color do I consider my like skin to the be? The actual color and composition of your skin. You mean not like actual, like technical, physical color, mm -hmm. kind of yellowy yes. pink? So, as a yellowish pink person, why is it difficult for you to eschew using the term white in discussion of yourself? I find that for the others, whether that be African American, Asian American, or even first immigration, first generation immigrants that may not have lost their identity as Scandinavian, Norwegian, Armenian, that might fall closer to the color of white, even though they're likely a tapioca color or an olive color. <clears throat> At some point, someone has to choose on a daily basis to be white because they look in the mirror and their skin might be my color, and yet they'll go out and choose to be white. In your relationship to yourself as a human being, why do you continue to be white? I think the most powerful thing is for you to lose that title, to lose that assumption that you have that you are white, because I do not see a white woman when I look at you. Um, when I hear that you're Catholic, when I see your hair, I'm like, hmm, I wonder where your family might have been from. I know that until many, many, many Italian young boys came back as heroes from World War II, in their communities, they were still called WAPs. They had to live with niggers and kikes and mix, and all those terms were still used in many immigrant communities. Their relationship to America and losing the title of other didn't change until that war. And our wars kind of give us our heroes so that we'll lose things, but certain groups still get to be, you know, blacked or othered. Um, yeah, so that's why is it so difficult to not be white? Um. So first, I mean, these are socially constructed categories, so I'm not, I'm not technically white, and black people aren't technically black, but, but the, these are categories that we have assigned these meanings to, and it has shaped my life to be assigned that racial category, right? My ethnicity is Italian, but my race is white. Pardon? Yeah. So if I understand you correctly, are, are you concerned that I'm reinforcing the categories by, okay. Um, yeah, I, I, that's kind of a master's tools dilemma, right? It's like these categories do have meaning in the same, right? We, they, um, I have been shaped by my assignment. Um, and in some ways, I would say that I, that I publicly stand up and say the things that I say is a way of not being white, right? Because for me, whenever I think of, oh God, you just shouldn't, you know, 
you shouldn't talk about this as a white person, then I'm like, well, then really, that's really being white, right? Is not to talk about it. And so um, I guess I want to get to that world where it doesn't matter, but we have to take account of how it has mattered um, and how, how it shapes the way I move through the world until I can really get honest about that. If I want to just jump over that and go into that universal place, I don't think it's going to change things. I think a lot of white people have tried to do that. I, I'm deaf in my one ear and I can't hear you. But at what point, who decided that you were white? Just as someone decided, and it maybe got entrenched in my mind that well, I happen to be a color that I don't really know what I am. Like I can shave and change, like working in Morocco, Spain, like pick going, I can change. Anyways, what I'm saying is I'm definitely not black. My skin is not black, just as that coat is not purple, but I will walk into a room and might be interact with people that will interact from a polemic of me being black and that's not even my skin color and for you to say that you're white and your skin isn't white and then to speak of your privileges as a white person where did you get that card like how did you get that card and why won't you lose that card why can't you just be an american woman with your family's history and discuss that and that's still pertinent <laughs> It, well, than reinforcing whiteness. it sounds to me like if I just didn't use that card, I'd be like every other white person who just walked around and never thought or talked about race or its shape on their lives. So I just can't do that. Um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know what I said. You and I maybe offline could go back and forth, but yeah. Um. I just want to be aware of the time. And can I get a time check? Because I'm five, it's 4.57. And, you know, I couldn't be more pleased with the number of hands that I see <laughs> shooting up for questions to be, you know, unpacked. And I just want to, re um, to reinforce that we do have a series of these coming. And this is just the beginning of the discussion. Um, we do need to be respectful of the time that we have, and, and we will offer a follow-up seminar on this, this Thursday from 12 to 1 to continue this conversation, and I would encourage you to come back with the questions that you have now and to bring more questions and to bring more people, because that is how we're going to be able to, to move this, this much-needed discussion forward. Um, and I don't want to come across that, I'm taking the mic, like, there's questions, no more questions, right? But we do need to be respectful of time. And I did ask Robin to leave us with a, a series of questions that we, can, that we can unpack as a group. So here, he asked me to give two questions, one for white people, one for people of color. So my questions for white folks are, what are the ways in which I uh, seek to save face, look good, kind of um, protect myself against this examination, right, and present myself to others as good to go, if you will. That's one question. The other question is pick a key identity that's very important to you. Could be gender, could be uh, sexuality, could be class, and reflect on how it intersects with, with your race and sets you up to collude with racism. So how did my gen, for me it would be, how did my gender socialization set me up to collude with racism? Right? It, it did. The, the answer isn't, oh, well, I, I've been oppressed as a woman, therefore I'm less colluded with racism. No. It, it, the, the patterns that I developed actually set me up to collude with racism. So that, that would be an intersectionality question for people of color to um, look at, well, one, just, um, oh, I had, what was that? To look at how you may buy into the divisiveness amongst groups of color, right? To kind of look around your circle and think about what, what groups of color are in my life or not in my life, and what might that be about, right? Where have I been separated from other people of color, and what are my beliefs and ideas or my justifications or rationalizations for that? Um, and the other question is, what would you want white people to understand? about racism. And I think Felix is going to write those up, right? Okay, and so I, w I will be back. I do have to go. <laughs> Thank you for your very, very um, 
uh, rap attention um, and time. And I'll be here next week. And we'll be talking about white fragility. Yeah. <laughs>